following our first webinar uh, on the specifics of the proposed EU Act for, for AI. Today, we'll focus more on the five actions for business leaders to take in preparing for the Act. A short introduction to myself. My name is uh, Mikael Monk. I'm the founder and CEO of 2021 AI. We are an fast-growing AI company focused on supporting our clients with uh, regulatory excellence, and not just for the AI Act in, in Europe, but for clients across the globe who's interested in new technologies and a little bit concerned with the regulations, the guidelines, and all of these things popping up for the moment. Now, just very quickly back to the uh, five actions for business leader. We are very excited to have uh, such a large audience already at our second uh, event. Uh, and we hope that this webinar will give you some insight, uh, some inspirations on, on how to tackle, how to solve these challenges with uh, the AI Act and potentially also other acts where, where we see governance, compliance for, for new technologies. Uh, King. So just before I give the word to uh, Peter Sindergaard, uh, just a very quick note on, on Peter's uh, impressive background. So with more than 30 years of experience from uh, Gartner, where Peter were the executive vice president and member of Gartner's, Gartner's operating uh, committee, addressing mission critical priorities for CEOs and different functions uh, across uh, the in, any organization we, we have uh, out there. Peter's uh, uh, organization itself uh, had more than 2,500 analysts at Gartner. So I can think of no one better uh, than Peter to uh, give an insightful presentation. Great. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, and um, I uh, obviously look forward to taking you through this topic. Um, this is a challenging topic. It's about the challenges that we face. Um, the topic, however, has two dimensions to it. It has a dimension which is about the usage of artificial intelligence, which drives substantial hyperscale change in organizations. And then the flip side, which is that it equally also imposes a degree of risk, maybe even some would say highly levels of risk uh, in all organizations. Uh, and as such, it becomes very important uh, for everybody to uh, deal with both aspects. Today, we will deal with the aspect of risk. In particular, therefore, uh, relate the rules that have been proposed by the European Union and explore some of the first and second level order issues that might arise from a business perspective uh, as we go forward. Now, we have to sort of start to set the stage for this. Uh, and obviously, therefore, our first point would be to look at how and what is actually proposed. This really proposes three levels of risk. This risk level is divided into, at first, unacceptable risk, which are systems that today would not be advised by the European Union or by governments that adopt the regulation. It's a high level risk set of categories, which we will explore more. And then of course, there are the minimal levels of risk. Now, obviously, these are depicted almost as being equal. It is very likely that most organizations and society will see this more as a pyramid with the majority of the systems implemented being limited in minimal risk environments. However, uh, it is important for everybody to understand how this risk can change your organization. And the reason is, you may even ask, why should I bother? I work in the IT organization, and I'm not really bothered with this from a perspective of deploying the technology. This is, in fact, one of the first emerging technologies that seem to have an impact across the organization. And therefore, as we start to deploy this, this has immediately become a business issue, uh, more so than many other technologies that we may have deployed in the past or even other emerging technologies that we're contemplating uh, to deploy. So we need to understand these levels. Now, it's clear that the boundaries between the three are not well-defined. It's also clear that over time, 
certain AI environments will move from one to the other as we gain sophistication in the deployments. Now, of the three, the high risk category is in the document probably the best defined. I trust all of you have read the 200 page document. This is in fact, one of the most invigorating documents that you could ever imagine. After all, it was written by a combination of technology specialists, legal scholars, and politicians. The greatest combination in order for a new document to be put in place. However, as you scan over these 10 requirements, I think it will become immediately clear that there is not one single individual in your organization that actually has the responsibility for all of these. As you look at risk management system and the requirements, therefore, to document, maintain, and also ensure continuous environments uh, to be uh, managed, that clearly is something that lies both with the chief legal officer of an organization, as well as also with the board as part of managing this uh, in terms of the board's responsibility around risk. Or if you look at the aspect of human oversight, the systems have to include a degree of human oversight through software interfaces. That clearly is a responsibility that is uh, deployed within the HR organization, hence therefore the HR executive should be involved in this, as well as of course with all of these, it is either the CIO or the chief product officer that will retain responsibility for ensuring that all of these are adhered to. The bottom line is this is actually a technology area, an emerging technology area that in many ways immediately becomes an enterprise level responsibility. And that is why it is so important to understand first, second, and even third level and degree responsibilities, challenges, and issues that arise from this. So the question is, who should be involved in this aspect of AI governance? Well, we've picked a number of them. Clearly above these different executives, you will find the board and we will talk later about the responsibilities of the board. And below it, or maybe even around it, you will find the technology function and the CIO as being responsible for all aspects of ensuring that this works to the standards of the organization. But each business function and the executive responsible for that business function has unique responsibilities for the deployment, adherence, and maintenance of this future charter. The CFO has responsibility for the cost of artificial intelligence, but also financial risk. And since this poses a level of financial risk, that individual, he or she, becomes critical in the deployment. The chief data officer, if organizations have that, is obviously responsible for this under the context of coordinating the data governance and also AI governance charter for the organization. The CEO, she or he, obviously has to be the person of oversight accountable in private organizations to the board and in public organizations, to politicians in terms of setting the overall organizational accountability, but of course also looking at this positively, how in fact this can drive innovation and therefore revenue growth for uh, the organization. The CMO is responsible for articulation of how this impacts customers, uh, citizens, and therefore should be one of the key people, and we will talk about this later, involved in the articulation of a customer or brand charter for the organization. What is it that you will, uh, you will be stand, what is your position, what, what is your brand stand for when it comes to artificial intelligence? The chief legal officer, as we touched on earlier, is very involved in this, as is the chief human resource officer. The point being, 
all executives are immediately evolved in an emerging technology, which is why the proposal from the European Union immediately becomes important for everyone. Now, again, you may say, I am neither of these positions, so why am I involved in this? First, you need to know that this is a technology that has enormous interest, but also awareness in the executive team. And secondly, you will not have seen similar situations in the past. This is clearly a new area, perhaps akin to what is happening with security in many organizations in that it is important for you to be aware of and likely involved in a broader collection of individuals in the organization who are interested in the deployment of this technology. Right, with that, we can now start to speculate, perhaps even formulate specifically areas that will be impacted or that your organization should clearly start to consider now. And those are the five areas that I would want to see business leaders focus on uh, as we move forward. The first is, and I alluded to this earlier, is the involvement of the board. The board is responsible uh, for risk. Uh, the board is equally responsible for the strategy of organization. So as we started with outlining the fact that artificial intelligence both drives innovation and therefore growth, but also poses level of risk that needs to be better management, this sits purely and squarely with the board. So it becomes important that this year, boards have a conversation about how they will deal with this in the future. Now, many may say, well, wait a minute, this is only a proposal. It has not yet been finalized, nor has it been built into national legislation. And you're right. This may in fact take as long as it took GDPR to be implemented across Europe. However, since this is something that immediately becomes deployed around different technologies in your organization, the sooner you start, the easier the management of this becomes when in fact this becomes a legal requirement. Just think about it. You still don't know how many applications run in your organization. So how can you therefore know whether some of those applications in fact by stealth have artificial intelligence or machine learning models built into them. This is why the board needs to be involved now and set the requirements across the organization for what should happen. The next thing is the accountability of business leaders. It is very clear that artificial intelligence is different in many ways than other technologies. And you may then ask, why is that? Well, we are clearly rapidly evolving into a situation in which we can frankly start to talk, talk about the engagement or employment of digital employees. A couple of nights ago, I participated in a very interesting call in which a, an AI vendor demonstrated the capability of actually creating a digital investment banker. Uh, this was done with, within a low-code or no-code environment, allowing you basically to put together an environment that may not necessarily emulate everything that an investment banker does from a work perspective, but surely were supportive of certain tasks and functions that investment bankers did. Now, therefore, Every person in an investment bank that starts to manage people or be accountable for a certain amount of business, therefore increasingly has AI part of their responsibility. Add to that then the EU charter and the definitions of different risk levels, it will become important for every leader in investment banks, and now let's broaden it out because all of you will have digital employees. And as a result, therefore, every leader needs to become aware of 
and in fact manage environments that contain artificial intelligence and machine language codes. As a result, therefore, they need to be aware of the ramifications of the legislation and the risk levels that pertain to the Artificial Intelligence Act that has just been proposed. So business leaders uh, really have to start to build awareness, build personal critical capabilities and competencies in the artificial intelligence. In fact, artificial intelligence data and data science really become a broad business leadership skill set or competency. Leaders will be hired on the basis of whether or not they know how to manage in such environments. So the second point here, business leader accountability, is really critical uh, for what will happen going forward. Our third point is the point around continuous monitoring. Now, as I said early on, you likely don't know the exact number of applications that run across your organization. Certainly, if your organization is a larger organization, it's highly likely that this week, a new piece of software was brought in in a department somewhere in your organization. And ultimately, with that, follows a requirement, therefore, to understand whether or not those products contain um, machine learning environments or environments, in fact, that now start to be part of and need to, to be defined in the context of the three risk levels that we saw earlier on. So that means that we need to think about how do we deploy a centralized repository that in some way doesn't only keep an asset inventory of what was bought, but also contains a continuous way of monitoring these environments so that we know whether or not they changed. If you go back to our three levels and perhaps more, more better depicted as a pyramid, those different environments that you have may, may likely move up and potentially down into those risk levels. And therefore, you need to know at any given time where your organization stands on this. So continuous monitoring and the ability to uh, operationally monitor at a central level what happens, behavior of the models and the impact of the models become critical for every organization. This is a responsibility that lies with the executive team. You will need to ensure that accountability is assigned somewhere in the organization at minimal, at a coordinating level, and in some instances, possibly at an accountability or responsibility level. So continuous monitoring is critical. And I just go back to my question. You don't know how many applications you have, so you likely don't know how many AI models you have running in your organization. This has in fact given rise to what one could call shadow AI. Many of you will in the past remember what we termed as being the end user shadow application environments. AI is in some way mimicking this or replicating those kind of situations where we don't know who will bring in these environments because they come embedded within systems and aren't necessarily uh, clearly indicated uh, as systems that may pose risk. Obviously here, as we go back to what the proposal from the European Union is, there will eventually be a national and European level repository that will in fact contain information about the level of risk within all products and therefore services that are supported by products as we go forward. And this will likely become uh, an inventory that gets used by organizations in terms of approving products that come into their organizations. But again, 
The challenge becomes when you have shadow deployment of technology, the actual end user may not in fact know whether or not a product poses risk. We will get back to that in our fifth point. Our fourth point is that how do you now then determine when technology enters the organization and especially when technology at a certain risk level enters the organization. And while some people here may regard it as a choke point, it's very clear that as we look at deployment uh, of the regulation, the role of purchasing, the organization purchasing becomes critical in this. The role of purchasing right now is actually a point of record and often also a point of continuous monitoring of products and services across the organization. It becomes important that we educate and empower the purchasing organization so that they in fact can become part of the deployment of a continuous evolving asset registry of the machine learning models that are deployed in the organization. It will not be wise to have the deployment and continuous monitoring of these environments reside separate to the organization that in many ways is part of monitoring the entry and perhaps also the usage of technology. So the combination of working with purchasing uh, and the uh, IT organization becomes a critical part of ensuring that the organization can adhere to these standards as we move forward and, and can embed the legislation effectively inside the actions of the organization. And then last, and perhaps even more broad than just about the EU charter, which of course is only a narrow sliver of what in many ways is the impact of artificial intelligence across organization, we have communication. Communication uh, has always been critical, uh, has in fact over the course of the last 18 months shown itself as being really vital to informing people about what goes on in the organization. Now, with the deployment, the increased proliferation of artificial intelligence across your organization, uh, we are rapidly getting to a stage in which it becomes important for the executive team to really formulate what is your approach to, what is your vision for artificial intelligence going forward in your organization? Now, why is that? Well, your customers will encounter technology that you deploy that uses artificial intelligence, but may have reservations, may in fact uh, more rapidly be governed by specific legislation, or may just uh, want to know so that when they engage with you, they kind of know what kind of organization am I working with? Your suppliers will increasingly need to know how and what your products contain, even if you have a services oriented structure, what it contains in terms of machine learning models, because if you are part of their value chain, then of course they need to certify their end products from a perspective of the legislation as we move forward. So suppliers and any value chain that exists will clearly need to know about the partners that they have and therefore the level of AI risk that the products and the services that you purchase from them actually pose. And last but certainly not least, employees uh, increasingly need to understand what does uh, the organization stand for in terms of usage of artificial intelligence. And we have seen this emerge here over the course of the last 
18 months as more and more people have worked from home, it's become clear that there may be technologies that are running in the background that may in fact in some instances monitor us or that we in fact have deployed technologies that in some way contain artificial intelligence. And that may for some employees pose a degree of uncertainty about their role, their job in your organization and how things are changing. So employees need to know about this. The EU proposal supports a, a proactive communication to different stakeholders. Your responsibility, and perhaps it's not your personal responsibility, but it is most certainly your organization's responsibility, is right now to start to work on three separate charters. One for your customers that talk about what is your view, usage, and approach from an ethical perspective around artificial intelligence, some of which you may communicate publicly, for example, on your website. Secondly, you need a charter for your suppliers. And in fact, you need to embed this inside the purchasing and engagement activity with your suppliers, because increasingly, I will want to know if I am an auto manufacturer or an airplane maker, what level of risk does products that I buy contain to my overall architecture of the product that I'm now designing, given that the majority of products now, and certainly all products in the future, will have a digital twin kind of instance. So suppliers become critical from a particularly important charter perspective. And then last but not least, we have employees. For our employees, it becomes important really to see what does the organization stand for. It is really about articulating the vision, the aspiration of what we want to be. Because employees over the next five years will encounter digital employees that they work with. And the question is, what is your approach to that? And certainly the EU uh, proposal drives a certain aspect of this going forward. So in summary, whatever your role is, this is in fact the first time that an emerging technology so rapidly has become an issue that is an issue for all executive environments. And therefore, uh, within the IT organization, if you are working with the, these technologies, you should expect a different approach within your organization because very rapidly the executive team have to become engaged. Now, the executive team may say, this is too early, we are going to wait, which frankly, many executive teams did with regards to GDPR. However, I would argue, one, this is a different kind of deployment. Two, for anyone that has gone through technology challenges the last couple of years, we all know a little preparation sets us free. And being prepared for this now, making this part of the executive team's discussion is actually critical. It will make things much easier for you as we move into the next couple of years in which certainly vast majorities of this proposal will become embedded into national legislation across Europe. And therefore, whether you're a European in headquartered organization, or you are operating in Europe, this becomes the executive team's issue. Thank you. A fantastic uh, presentation on uh, this exciting uh, subject. And thank you for clarifying uh, the uh, subtle details. And there's also, if we look at the comparing to GDPR, if we look at the, uh, the, the many roles and responsibilities, this, this uh, actually will in, encompass across an organization. And thank you, uh, Katrine, for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, Katrine, true pleasure to have you with us here today. Thanks. Uh, Katrine, so now we, um, we had a great perspective from Peter um, on, on the action for business leaders to take. So if we for a moment uh, also turn to the board, 
Um, my question is really, uh, how can you expect that boards at large uh, will react to, to an act like the EU Act? And um, how will such reactions impact the same group of business leaders we, we, we were just uh, uh, talking about in, in, in Peter's presentation? Sure. Um, first of all, many thanks for the invite here for today. Pleasure. And hello, everyone out there. It's such a great pleasure to be here. Um, and also, Michael, many thanks for the question. I think it's uh, for obviously reasons it's super relevant to have uh, this sport perspective on these uh, topics, because this is not only an agenda um, for data scientists and executives within the organization. This is also a board agenda. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, you might know that board of directors is actually having the overall responsibility for a company. And while it can be a little bit black box, what a board is supposed to, you know, decide and have a discussions, it is a super, super relevant discussion within the boardrooms to have these kind of uh, ambitions on how to move forward, how to leap forward in a tech world. Um, it's actually already going on out there in the, at the board tables to have these kind of it's early discussions, but we're having the discussions on what to do with applied AI and yeah. what is the role of the board executives, and then also what should we, you know, set of requirements towards the team within the organization. And I think there's two sides of the coins. Uh, one side of the coin will then be, you know, to ask all the questions in how do you stay on top of the market uh, by providing uh, applied AI, AI and new uh, business models? Uh, what kind of investments are we actually going to need? Um, what, do we have the skills in place uh, within the organization who should drive it forward? That will be, I would say, the positive side of the coin. But then because we have this overall um, responsibilities and we have board duties, um, board members are by nature a little bit concerned when you have a discussion on innovation. And we are here to, you know, also protect the company. Mm -hmm. So I would say not immediately, but almost we will jump right into the discussions on risk management, governance, compliance topics related to a given kind of topic, but in particular when you're discussing applied AI. Mm. And then when you add that the devil lies in the details, when you have AI, you will expect to see your board directors now get some pretty specific questions for you without uh, or across the organization, asking a lot of questions, trying to grasp, trying to understand what is going on, what are we doing, and what's the risk? So that is basically, you know, the risk uh, angle in this topic. That is a huge board discussion already out there across European companies. And uh, first of all, the first thing I want to touch upon is how are we actually supposed to do these kind of impact assessments? Are we capable and are we able today? I would ask my team, my uh, in my organizations. Are we able to do these kind of assessments? Do we have the right toolbox in place? And if not, uh, then what's the plan? Uh, are we going to you know, get help from suppliers? And if that's the case, do we have some kind of supply chain AI policy? Uh, how do we know that our suppliers supplying AI solutions, models, deploying models, helping us? How are we going to know uh, what kind of data collection they are, you know, utilizing um, how do we make sure that data is not biased stuff like that that is one part of the discussion and a concern at board level the other part and uh, peter also touched upon that uh, specific topic is how are we providing uh, information to our stakeholders of a company about how we are actually utilizing emerging technologies so what kind of information are we providing for shareholders, for the authorities, for customers and clients on uh, how we are actually going to drive data collective uh, and applications forward? 
So for example, are we going in our uh, organization to explain to customers when they are encountering AI generated data, when we are using their data for their own products? Do we tell them about this uh, specific topic? And do we have some kind of public statement? That is another question. So, you know, the dilemmas will queue up and we will have a lot of questions for you out there. Um, and also Peter talked about this shadow AI. And I think that is super relevant because that would be a big issue for board as well to, you know, make sure that our organization can, uh, you know, deliver on accountability and transparency and to try to explain to the board how do we do explainable AI and not what you can call black box AI or shadow AI? Uh, we will definitely need to have some answers here because we have, as I mentioned, some duties and we will report on these things. So you should be prepared and expect questions about the whole transparency accountability. Um, and also how are we actually going to follow standards and also strengthen them? So, you know, the list is long and what's new in these kind of discussions is that board members are going to be specific because this is a super uh, interesting, but also complex topic. And we need in order to understand what we are responsible for, we need to have these kind of specific questions. So the organizations should be ready for taking these kind of questions for the next three years. Thank you so much, uh, Katrine, and uh, welcome back to you, Peter, uh, for this uh, fireside chat. So, so thank you very much for this perspective. And, and um, I, I think also in my experience, uh, once we start talking about risk management, then, then it really becomes complex. And it, especially with a emerging technology where, where the boundary is for, for what is accepted, what is not accepted, is not, not um, totally clear yet, right? Yeah. So, so I guess the point here is also that this, this is not something that's going to be carved in stone tomorrow. Yeah. This is something that, that we have to realize that this will change over time. We, we probably also, and we will come back to that, have to realize that AI is not the only technology that, that the EU wants to regulate uh, right now. We, we, we are looking at potentially all disruptive technologies uh, that we have out there, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, before I continue on, uh, on that track, uh, welcome back, uh, Peter. Uh, mm -hmm. Now um, to, to Katrine's point uh, on, on, on the board and, and the, the, you can say, influence from the board towards the business leaders. Any reflections on that? No, I think I mean I, I think Katrina is spot on. Um, I mean, I mean the, the board and executive leaders are really focused on three things. They're focused on growth of the organization, they're focused on cost, yes, and they're focused on risk. Um, AI will actually impact all three, but in different ways. And our focus today obviously has been on the risk side. Yeah, uh, but we shouldn't forget that that uh, th there are two other dimensions to this that are really important uh, to to follow, and I think you know that 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 is reflected in also what what Katrina said. So um, yeah, yeah, and I like that point, right? Because today we we certainly the focus is risk. It's yeah. the uh, laws, it's, it's the regulation, but there's a uh, pretty good reason why people are engaging on the uh, AI journey, so to speak, why they're deploying AI. Yeah. So all the benefits, of course, right? But but there, there's a cost to that for the moment on, on, on the other side, uh, what, what we're looking into here. Yeah. So, so actually, um, before I, I go on with my questions here, I, I see we have some, uh, some questions from, uh, from the, uh, the audience uh, that I would like to bring up. So, uh, so one is, uh, how should business uh, leaders, businesses engage with uh, regulators in the future? And uh, I will actually try to take a first uh, step at that one. Yeah. Um, because we've been there ourselves and, and we are engaging with, with regulators for the moment and not just in Europe. Uh, we were part of the uh, ethical guidelines for trustworthy. Our initiative started almost three years ago, uh, had great uh, interaction, 50 companies across Europe uh, engaged uh, on, on, on that. And, and that actually led to the uh, proposed AI Act. And, and what we're seeing now is we, we, we have a phase now where more than 200 companies in Europe 
have given uh, responses, feedback to the current state of, of the uh, EU Act. And what we'll see now is then that, that that's all going to be condensed. Uh, it's all going to be worked through in, in the EU. But, but these are typically the large organizations with capacity to, to respond to, to such a massive um, in, engagement, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, so what we're seeing in Europe is is, is more a we, we still call it pen and paper uh, approach where we can read through these things, but we also work with regulators uh, elsewhere in, in in the world, and and there's there's a um, there's a clear understanding that um, technology also need to support the businesses who want to stay compliant. Right. So the point about getting and see mark, how do you do that? You know, what are the platforms you need to support this? This is not something you just do to get the CE mark as the post uh, market uh, surveillance of models and so on and so forth. So, so it's pretty, um, it's a pretty high engagement. Yeah, I fully agree. And then, um, so I have been working with public affairs and regulatory affairs for the last 12 years within the technology sector. And uh, my experience says that it's uh, how should you engage with authorities a little bit different if you are a big company or you are a minor company. If you are, you know, some kind of a market leader, you should definitely do uh, a dialogue and drive that kind of a di dialogue proactively. Um, and if you are a minor company, my suggestion will always be to, you know, go through a trade or association and they will have the dialogue uh, towards the authorities and you know make policy uh, uh, makings papers uh, positioning your company towards these kind of regulators for the large companies for great enterprises who really you know uh, is playing a big role in societies for example within the whole digital infrastructure sector uh, it's important to have the dialogue and it's really important you have the dialogue before you get into trouble. <laughs> Trust me, you need to have this kind of proactively dialogue and that goes on the political level and it goes on the regulatory level and sometimes also through the media. And there will be different kind of stages that you can seek your influence. Uh, first stage is, of course, through public opinion, because a discussion is the first stage towards, you know, real hardcore policy making. Then there will be a policy process where you have this forth and back dialogue with politicians, and then there is a law. And then after that, they have to implement the law. And there you can also see influence how located, uh, how you implement. But for minor companies, you will go through a trade association. And then I think that there'll be multiple stages from a regulatory evolution perspective. Uh, obviously, what we're seeing now with this proposal is it's a horizontal proposal, right? It, it applies across the board, but it's very clear that, in, and there's elements of the proposal that, that is uh, actually associated with uh, the manufacturing industry when you, when you for those of you that have read it, you will see that there's references to, uh, to the manufacturing side. I think what will happen is that industries that have particular regulatory environments, uh, certainly like manufacturing, but probably more interesting things or areas like pharmaceutical uh, and the financial services industry, there'll be a second level of regulatory implementation that, that, that comes through there, influenced likely by, the, by sort of the horizontal charter. Yes, that's a, that's a fantastic point. And we've probably seen already the first uh, kind of use case is already implemented as examples in the uh, AI Act. So, so, so that leads me to uh, the question around uh, what can we expect now? Now, this is this is AI uh, we will we we're looking at. But what about uh, all the other technologies that all actually also have an impact uh, on us as human beings, which is sort of a key, a key criteria around this uh, this regulation. So, so. What what to expect then? Yeah, want to um, that's a really really interesting questions, and I think if I got all the answers, I would not be here. I would be very very rich somewhere. Um, but I think it's a relevant question. Um, so the overall trend for Europe is to you know try to regulate in order to set some ethical standards, yes. avoiding not ending up like for example China. 
uh, and also we have had the discussion around what some have called civilian capitalism from some of the large tech companies where you are actually utilizing data, shadow AI, and then you know use people's data and sell it like predictive uh, products to a third company, and then you are targeted back. And basically the uh, Brussels offices, they are trying to build new set of standards in order to you know, set global standards based on ethical thinking, trustworthiness, and transparency. And that does not only goes for AI, it's also going for you know, blockchain, automated processes, robotics, you know, 5G. Uh, there's a lot of different kind of infrastructure and technology, but it all will be summed up in a European angle saying, we should you know, go the third way and not the Chinese way or the American way, but you know, trying to have an ethical use of new technology. We will see if that will do the trick, but that is the logic. So, so I, I will not say counter to that, but 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 just as a as a key point here, uh, and that's to you, Peter. Uh, is there a risk really that Euro is maybe getting a little bit too far ahead in terms of setting these standards? Uh, we're still in a competitive world, and, and others might be uh, not under the same scrutiny, the same legislation as we as we see in Europe. Yeah, there's there's always the um, glass half full, glass half empty uh, discussion. Um, uh, so, if we start with kudos to European Union, right? Uh, they have in fact actually legislated or attempt to legislate in an area that's relatively early. Um, and and because waiting could have had uh, worse impact no, so for us, right? So that that's the glass half full. Looking at it from the European Union perspective, there is the challenge, and I think uh, at times uh, Europe has been somewhat slow uh, at scalable uh, innovation environments. Mm -hmm. We 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 lack large scale in Europe large-scale um, uh, emerging technology providers. Um, and so the question that I think we should all pose ourselves, and, and this is going to be a balancing act, is uh, when, when is when is regulation too much so it kills innovation? Um, and, and because we can't afford innovation to be killed. So the, so the European Union uh, is, is running this balancing act companies and organizations run the same balancing acts. We're all balancing risk uh, versus versus growth um, with the available cost we have. So that's kind of a fundamental of, of organizations. So I, 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 I think Europe is ahead. I think there is a risk Europe gets too deep into that let's regulate before something is out. Uh, and I think we need to monitor that. Uh, because we can, Europe cannot afford in, in global technology competition to actually fall behind. Yep. Good point. So, so what we're hearing a lot is also this, that um, move fast and break things, that doesn't really go with AI, right? We, we yeah. don't, don't want to break too many things with AI. <laughs> so it's probably good that, that we are seeing a level of uh, regulation yeah. and structure around these. Yeah. yeah. And also because we have seen actually some cases where it's too late to, you know, stop it again. So when you are there, you are there. That is also, you know, the logic behind the Brussels uh, policy here in yeah. th this aspects that we need really to, you know, we have been doing thinking for hundreds and hundreds of years. And some of the basic questions that we had five or 400 years ago, we're going to ask them again, how is we, equ uh, what kind of, what is equally, uh, uh, frames for any kind of human being and such a, you know, exis existential questions. Thank you very much. We have another question from, from uh, the audience, actually, and that is how to instill a sense of urgency uh, at or on boards and senior leadership. Any best practices or business cases that, that uh, we, we, we can see? And maybe I should start with you, Peter, for, from the business leaders at lead, and then, then Katrina, if you take the, the, the board here. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, use cases are an, an important way of demonstrating particular uh, possibilities that exist. I go back to the point, though, that, you know, you start off with four, three categories of what companies are focused on, growth, uh, cost, risk. You then look at uh, obvious case areas in each of them and how you map them to that. 
that will often be very dependent on which uh, vertical industry you are based in. Um, so, so it's hard to come up with UK use cases. There are some broad ones uh, that, that you could deem horizontal use cases, uh, fraud detection models, uh, you, you know, so, so relatively simple aspects. Um, so I think start with sort of a, an approach of linking it to that. Now, the, 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 the second thing, and I'll make this short because it's actually a big topic, is uh, keep in mind that very often you are trying to sell the board or the executive team on something that doesn't exist. Nobody has seen it before. And so that means that your personal skill set uh, as a storyteller becomes critical. This is why the whole concept of storytelling has become so important for everybody out there, because our ability to explain something that doesn't exist become really critical. So I, I think one is be very practical, link it to the business uh, aspect. The use case is there. There are tons of them out there and, and we have some in 2021, so for sure. Uh, but also uh, train yourself, become a better storyteller. Great point. I fully agree, fully agree. And then I could just add, um, maybe you should also start tracking your own ecosystem within startup world because that is other, another part of, you know, try to map out who will be, you know, upcoming competitors and what part of a value chain are you really in, you know, 10 years from now. And normally I use a little bit old example, but, you know, in 1996, Kodak was the fourth most valuable brand worldwide. In 2012, they filed for bankruptcy. And why was this the case? Well, basically because they didn't want to provide a digital camera, fearing it would cannibalize the whole customer base. So, uh, and they didn't, they didn't simply get that they were part of a software game based in Silicon Valley. So they filed for bankruptcy. And like you say, storytelling, keep these kind of example in mind that we, we need to push forward. We need to go forward and uh, you know, what's out there, what's the value chains, who's the competitors, what's the new technologies, who's your startup ecosystem, you know, teach your board members these kind of aspects because they, they, they really don't know. Thank you very much, uh, Katrine. Thank you so much, Peter. I think it's, uh, it's my uh, time now to wrap up uh, just very, very quickly on this. Thank you, uh, of course, uh, the audience for participating today. Pleasure to have you uh, on, on, on this web, uh, webinar. So if I'm allowed just a few uh, takeaways. So, so, so one is that uh, the EU Act might be some years in the future, uh, still in the making, uh, still being uh, finally ratified and, and, and defined. But, but actually uh, two, three, four years, it's not a long time when, when we're dealing with these uh, new technologies. So, so you better get started uh, actually now on, on this journey. And we saw it from the questions also that how do we do this? How do we actually go about this? How do we engage our organization? And that time is, is already now. So another point is that the, uh, the EU Act is just one of many, I would say there will be an inflow of global uh, AI regulations, best practices, guidelines, ethical use of AI. There, there's gonna be a lot of this. This is also going to be a global uh, phenomenon. So, so in, in each part of the world where we actually have businesses and you want to deploy and use these models, you have to comply with, with local regulations. So, so a key takeaway here is you have to keep a flexible mindset, a flexible solution to how you approach it because it's not just one law that you have to comply with. And then again, uh, I really uh, like the point about storytelling. I think that's fantastic. Uh, I think we can, can all be uh, better storytellers. So, so uh, uh, certainly a, a fantastic uh, key takeaway from, the, uh, from, from today. So finally on our side, um, please uh, be aware that uh, the, uh, the webinar will be uh, available uh, in, in, uh, on our webpage also. You can uh, get Peter's slides. Uh, you can share this with uh, your co uh, colleagues, your, your friends, your family, whoever you want to share this with. I think the, the insights were fantastic. Uh, and certainly also, if anyone has questions, 
that they uh, did not come today, uh, please come forward and share these with us, and we'll do our utmost to uh, to respond to these. That was all from us today. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to the audience. Have a fantastic uh, day, evening, uh, wherever you are in terms of uh, time zone. Thank you all.